So it's going to say they've got quite a, um, I guess, interdisciplinary mixed background. So I used to be a physicist by training. Then I went, did my PhD in com complexity science. Then I was um, in the behavioral science group. And then now I'm in the computer science uh, department. So I've kind of been across quite a few departments. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is a mixture of some of the work that I did before joining Exeter. So I've been at Exeter for just over a year. Um, so I hardly know campus because uh, it was all, as all, basically I've always been working from home. So talk to me, I will talk a bit about the work they did before um, I came to the University of Exeter uh, when I was at uh, Warwick Business School in the Data Science Lab. And then I'll also talk about some of the more recent uh, projects that I'll be working on. So throughout the talk, uh, over the next, let's say, hour or so, I will show you some kind of examples of the, the kind of research that I do. And hopefully that will also give you an idea of the kind of data that I work with and the kind of, you know, kind of research questions I think are, are, are interesting and what I find interesting and fascinating about them and what some of the challenges uh, and opportunities are. So to start with, I'm going to start, uh, let's see, okay, I'm going to start talking about um, a, a couple of projects that I did when I was, uh, as I said, at Warwick Business School uh, on measuring crowd size. And this is a theme that we kind of um, go through some of the further examples that I will talk about later on. So measuring crowd size um, is important for many reasons. Um, so, you know, crowds, large crowds, in, uh, by large crowds, I mean, you know, say, people, you know, crowds with order of thousands of people, tens of thousands of people or even more, you know, can gather for uh, a variety of reasons. You know, there could be like large events, uh, you know, large parades, so like uh, the one depicted here. There could be uh, large protests where, you know, thousands of people gather to protest uh, for uh, a variety of different reasons. Or there's also um, a lot of, um, and there could be a lot of other reasons such as, um, you know, political reasons uh, here. Uh, when uh, you know, lots of people gathered uh, for Trump's inaugural ceremony when he uh, became president of the United States, the United States, and that, this is a particularly interesting example that I interesting example that I always use uh, when introducing this work because um, if you remember when you know when when this event took place, there was the inaugural ceremony, and then a couple of days later, in the same exact area. Um, there was a, the Women's March, there was a, a protest, and there was a lot of debate in the news and online, uh, in, the, in the general public and amongst journalists and among supporters uh, or, or people against, um, you know, uh, Donald Trump, the president of the United States, on, you know, which, which of the two events had more supporters. You know, there was, uh, you know, kind of almost like two factions saying, you know, one, uh, you know, Trump had more supporters, one, the, the Women's March had more supporters. So all of these um, examples have in common that, you know, large crowds uh, of people gather. And for a variety of reasons, in all of these examples, you know, people like uh, authorities, you know, policymakers, um, you know, security services, or event organizers might want to know how many people there are uh, in, the, in, the, in the location that, you know, we are studying. So for instance, in this case, uh, the location you can see here. Um, so say that there is an emergency and you have to evacuate the area um, you know, quickly, uh, you know, authorities or um, you know, emergency services might want to know um, roughly how many people there are, and they want so that they can maybe better coordinate how people can evacuate the area in uh, in a more efficient and fast way, for instance. But also, kind of more broadly, thinking about this more broadly, other than for say emergency reasons, knowing the size of a crowd in events, for instance, like this one, is um, important also for, you know, in, in a more kind of general context. So, you know, news recording is interested in uh, knowing how many people, for instance, attended a, a, a political event, because that can be a proxy of how much interest, you know, how much support a specific, in this case, president, but more in general, you can think of a political party or a protest movement, you know, how many people attend their event is a proxy of how much support that event has. And these can have an impact, you know, kind of more broadly in general public, okay, if people say that a specific party or a specific product or a specific movement has a lot of support, and uh, this might affect, you know, the, the perception of how they view, you know, the party uh, movement or protest, and they might change their mind on whether, you know, they might want to support that or they might want to uh, get engaged in trying to counteract that specific, you know, again, port, uh, party or protest or movement. So, kind of from a more broader perspective, or kind of news recording is also very, very important. It might affect the public perception of. Um, of a specific uh, personal movement. So for all these reasons, knowing the size of the crowd is important. 
and uh, in some cases it's important to have this uh, you know this number effectively uh, in a quick way in case of emergency so traditionally there's different ways in which this could be done so um, some of the kind of older techniques rely effectively on large scale high resolution images such as for instance could be this one or you know higher resolution ones and uh, you know people um, would sit and have a look at the images and uh, break down the image in uh, smaller subsections, count how many people they can see in a small section, and then kind of scale that up. Okay, so this is um, kind of a, a quite traditional way of doing it, which, you know, in a, in a way works relatively well. You know, it, um, you know, there have been quite a lot of examples in which this has been used, and, you know, it's been shown to, to provide reasonable estimates of how many people there are. But this has some issues. So the first one, of course, is that if you want to have this um, estimate of how many people there are in a specific area quickly, this procedure is not very quick because it requires you know, people to sit down. Well, it requires to have large, you know, high resolution images for, to start with. Then it requires people to do it, sit down and do it. This takes time. And of course, it's also kind of prone to a uh, human error. Uh, you know, if I sit down and do it, and then if you sit down and do it, we probably come up with different numbers. And this adds up, uh, you know, not just to the uncertainty, but also to the time because then you might want to do some quality control to see, okay, who, you know, who's, um, you know, where the errors are coming from and so on and so forth. So whilst this is potentially an approach, it's not very fast and, um, you know, it could be expensive in terms of the human labor required. Um, some more, uh, I guess, recent, let's say, uh, ways of doing it rely on analyzing images from cameras that are uh, kind of uh, present around, say, the, the area in which the crowd is gathering. Uh, using image processing techniques, you know, um, you can extract um, extract estimates of, uh, of how many people there are. You know, the, the, the recent advances in uh, computer vision using uh, in artificial intelligence, convolutional neural networks, and, you know, are pretty powerful in the sense they can use these tools to, for instance, extract uh, features from faces and they use that as a proxy um, for um, how many people are in a specific location. And kind of anecdotally, uh, it's quite a quite coincidence, I was actually marking a student project this morning that was doing exactly, you know, working on exactly that, that problem using convolutional neural network to, to estimate the size of a crowd. And again, it's something that can work quite well and it's faster than um, the, the previous approach I mentioned that requires human labor, but has some shortcomings. The shortcoming, you know, one of the major shortcomings being that, you know, the cameras have to be able to see the whole crowd effectively. So if the crowd is gathering in a location which has lots, you know, kind of a, kind of a funny shape, which has lots of um, obstacles throughout. So for instance, here you could have lots of trees, you could have parts of the building that obscure some of, a, of you know, a part of the crowd and in, in, you know, in other, in other similar um, kind of features that are, you know, I guess present in a, everywhere in the, in the city. Um, you know, this is, creates a problem because the, um, the, the cameras can't see the crowd and therefore the, the algorithms are not able to detect the, the frequent presence. So again, these these kind of techniques can work well, but they are not applicable in uh, all cases. So what we thought when we were working on, you know, when we started to work on this was well, all of the people here, or at least the vast majority of people here, would probably be there um, with a smartphone. Okay, they might use their smartphone to take pictures of you know themselves being there. They might post those pictures on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. They might make phone calls if uh, you know they're meeting. You know they know one of their friends is is uh, attending this event and trying to, to meet up. They might sending be sending a text. Um, so this um, you know this amount of um, kind of information that is shared and that um, you know the, the people are are, are generating um, is typically generated either using by mobile phones and even if you post on social media, you know typically you know if you do it, uh, do it when you're attending such an event, you will be doing it from your smartphone. So the idea we had was, well, can we use the sheer volume of information that we are generating um, when uh, you know, attending events uh, like this one to have quick and uh, reasonably accurate estimates of the size of the crowd? Okay. And so this was the kind of question that we, start, we set out to try and answer. So the challenges in answering these questions were um, mostly two. So the first one was uh, how can we do, you know, what, what data can we actually use? So when we started working on this project, we were lucky enough to have access to a large data set uh, that was provided by Telecom Italia, which is an Italian uh, mobile phone provider, which released a large data set of mobile phone data uh, as part of the big data challenge for um, researchers and um, academics to, to, to work on this. And so we had access to this large data set, which uh, was referring to the city of Milan in the north of Italy and covered a, period, a time period of two months. 
But what we had access to was a variety of sources from mobile phones. So for instance, the volume of phone calls. Um, so how many phone calls were, uh, you know, um, either, um, you know, people were people making or receiving in uh, each different part of the city on a 10 minute uh, time in interval, okay, for a two month period. We also had access to how many uh, text messages people were sending and receiving in the same area. Uh, we had access to how much um, data people were using, um, you know, were downloading or uploading to the internet uh, from through the smartphone. So it was a proxy of how much people are using the internet via the smartphones. And we also had access as part of the same challenge to the full geolocalized uh, Twitter data set for that two month period. So this meant we had access to I think about um, uh, 500,000 tweets over the whole time period over the whole city of Milan. So this was the data that we focused with. And um, just to give you an idea, for instance, here, um, we can see the volume of uh, phone calls made in the city of Milan aggregated over the two month period. And the more red an area is, um, the more phone calls there have been in the area over the two month period. And, um, you know, as, as, as this kind of broadly demonstrates, you know, it, it has information that you know, more, there's more phone calls uh, than in the center of the city, as you would expect, and less in the, kind of the periphery. And this gives us an indication, of course, um, you know, the, in the central the city, there's more people. And so this gives us kind of a vague indication that, you know, this, what we want, might want to do is, uh, is kind of feasible. However, the second challenge is, okay, we have the data, but what, you know, what case study, what example do we, uh, do we try and, um, and work on to measure the size of a crowd? As I said, it's a difficult problem. Um, and there's different ways of doing it. And, uh, you know, each with their own uncertainty. But what we need to try and answer our question is, well, can we have a case study where we have accurate estimates of how many people there are in that location um, over multiple, uh, you know, uh, times, multiple events so that we can train a model, um, you know, so that we can see if the data that we have um, is able to, to, to estimate the size of the crowd. Because of course, if we don't have a good kind of uh, accurate ground truth uh, data that we can use to calibrate our models, then um, this is, um, you know, this is not something that we can, uh, that we can easily do. So what we thought as a, as a kind of the ideal case study to, to focus on was that of football matches. So football matches take place inside football stadiums, which are kind of relatively, you know, well spatially enclosed um, uh, areas, you know, uh, in the, the, to go to attend the football match, you have to have uh, a ticket. And so you can only enter the stadium if you have a ticket. Uh, the number of uh, people attending the football match via the number of tickets sold is publicly available online. And um, there's a repeated football matches taking place inside the same, state, inside the same stadium, which uh, gives us uh, you know, multiple data points effectively to train our model. So we focus on this as our kind of preliminary initial case study as, uh, you know, to see, verify whether we could estimate the size of the crowd in a specific event. And then finally, also football matches take place over a small period of time, you know, typically say a couple of hours, last time for people, I guess, to act, uh, access the stadium and leave the stadium, but it's a, it's a relatively short period of time. Um, so we we'll see how this compares uh, to when trying to estimate the crowd over a long period of time uh, later on. So what we did then was extract the information from the data set that we had from mobile phone data and Twitter data for uh, the specific area, the specific um, geographical area where the football stadium was and compare that to the number of attendees which is what um, you can see here. So in this uh, initial case study, we had two months of data. Um, so luckily in the city of Milan, there's two football teams playing in the same stadium. So we had access to uh, a few more uh, matches than you know, if it was only one football team playing, but it was still a limited uh, number of data points, of course. But even so, um, we can see a very, a very strong relationship between the mobile phone data and the number of attendees um, in a tennis football match. So for instance, you know, the last match of our time period, the one on 27th of December is the one with the largest number of attendees. And across the three data sets that we have, so we combine together uh, phone calls and SMS activity. So that's the number of phone calls and the number of SMSs either received or sent in the area. Um, internet activities, as I said, is how much usage of the internet coming from smartphones there is from the area and Twitter activities, how many tweets are geolocated inside the stadium. So across all three data sets, we see that we have uh, the, the largest peak in correspondence with a uh, match which has the largest number of attendees. So we find a, a, a good, you know, a good uh, indication here that we might be able to use this kind of data to, to measure the size of the crowd. And indeed, if we fit a simple 
the linear model, again, as I said, you know, this is the initial study that we, we did, we only had 10 data points, uh, we find a good relationship between, uh, between the two. Interesting, we find the strongest relationship is between the volume of access to the internet uh, coming from smartphones and the number of attendees. And we hypothesize that this is because our smartphones typically access the internet in a passive way. So even if we're not using the smartphone, even if it's my, in my pocket or in my, in the backpack or in my coat, my smartphone will still be connected to the internet every now and then to download, you know, emails and notifications from, you know, WhatsApp or, or any other uh, messaging platform that you use. And so this data is generated uh, more passively, whereas, you know, making phone calls or make, sending an SMS or uploading something onto Twitter is a more active behavior. And therefore we hypothesize that this is why the relationship is stronger um, when we uh, use data drive from how much uh, people use the how much activity from internet activity that is coming from smartphones. But this works, you know, for phone calls and SMS as well, quite similarly, and also for the for the number of uh, tweets that have been posted from, from within this data. So this was the initial study that we did, and we've seen that you know we can um, estimate uh, reasonably accurately the number of people attending uh, a large event like a football match. And crucially, you know, if the access to the data uh, was available in real time to, for instance, event organizers or authorities or security services or emergency services, these estimates could be generated you know, in close to real time, let's say. You, know, you just have to analyze the data, but they can be generated quickly. And in situations where you need to have quick estimates of the size of the crowd, this is, uh, you know, this would be particularly important. However, you know, as I said, this was an initial study. So in this paper, we actually also looked at a second case study, which is that of an airport, um, because uh, we thought that, you know, airports, again, are kind of, again, spatially in kind of enclosed environments. And we don't have exact, uh, you know, number of people attending, um, as, you know, being in the airport at any given time. Um, but we use the number of incoming and departing flights as a proxy for the number of people. And we, we seen that even in that case, of course, the relationship is less strong because, I mean, the, our ground truth data, let's say, is uh, kind of, a, in, in a way, is a rough proxy of the number of people there. But again, we find that there is a good relationship between, between these two. However, we wanted to go further. And to go further, we looked at a different data set, which is uh, that of Instagram. So we downloaded, uh, we retrieved the geolocalized photos posted to Instagram in the city of uh, Milan and Rome in Italy. Um, for the whole of 2014, okay? And what we did was uh, effectively kind of an extension of the study that I've just shown. So we um, retrieved the geolocation of where the photos are posted um, to Instagram in 2014, and then we see if we can ge again generate estimates of the size of the crowd um, attending again football matches. And again, we picked Milan and Rome because both cities, so both football stadiums uh, um, host matches from two teams, and we had, so in this case, we had a whole year of data. In each stadium, there's two teams, so there's uh, a much larger uh, number of data points. So I think in each case, we had about 40 to 50 uh, football matches in the whole year, which is uh, large, much larger than the previous study. So what you will see here in the video that I'm starting now is um, the geolocation of all the photos posted to Instagram in the city of Rome uh, on a specific day. So the day was 21st of October, 2014. However, this is not just a random day, it's a day where an important photo match takes place. And if we look at the stadium where the, you know, the, the match was taking place, throughout the day, there's not much activity going on on Instagram. But as we approach when the football match is, we have a sharp increase in the number of photos being posted, which is what we'd expect based on our previous study and just also on our intuition. But can we use, again, this uh, volume of information um, to uh, extract the size of the crowd? So, in this study, as I said, we looked at two different cities, Milan and Rome. We analyzed data for the whole of 2014, so January to December. And we had, as I said, depending, I think in Milan and Rome, had around 45 football matches in each. Um, anecdotally, it's just interesting to see that um, in summer, when there's no football matches, you know, football stadiums are used for other events, uh, such as concerts or you know, other large events. So there is Instagram activity, so people post photos from within the stadium in those time periods, but there is no football match. So therefore, we don't have any ground truth data of uh, you know, how many people were present in the football stadium. Um, so that's why there is uh, you know, th th this time period where we don't con consider the Instagram data because we do not have a ground truth data for how many people were present in the concert. There is kind of anecdotal reports in the news of how many people attend the concert, but there's no ground truth kind of accurate data. Um, 
So um, but again, you know, in, in both cases, we find that you know uh, matches that have the largest number of attendees correspond to match, uh, you know, to, to higher um, volume of information coming from Instagram. And what we look at here is uh, the number of Instagram users. So, for instance, if a person was sharing multiple photos in say, you know during the same photo match, we actually count them as one. So we actually count the number of unique users posting an image from within the stadium during the football match. So if you use a post more than one image, we uh, only count them as one. Um, again, you know, we find a, a good relationship between the two, but what we found by looking at this analysis kind of more spread out over time, over a whole year, was something else which is quite interesting, which, which I think is quite important when, um, you know, when working with this kind of data, uh, you know, it's something that is quite important to be aware of. So for instance, if I focus on, um, uh, on, the state, on the stadium in Milan, Okay, so because we had data for a whole year, we actually had data for, um, let's say, six months of one football season, and then the six months of, or, you know, uh, I guess summer doesn't count, but let's say four months of one football season, and then another four or five months of the next football season with summer in between. So if we separate the, our analysis by football season, we see that, you know, we obtained the, the two lines that you can see there. But what is interesting about them is that both in Milan and Rome, the, uh, the fitted line corresponding to the second part of the year, so let's the, the, say the second football season, is always, um, let's go, a smaller slope than the red line. So this is interesting, you know, because, uh, you know, why in both cases the, 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 blue, the blue line has a smaller slope. And we hypothesized that this is because when working with this kind of data, in particular social media data, uh, such an Instagram, in, in, so this was 2014, Instagram in 2014 was, uh, hugely growing in terms of uh, its popularity. So when you work with this kind of data, you have to take into account that the popularity of, for instance, Instagram changes over time. In particular, in our case, the number of Instagram users was rapidly uh, rapidly growing in that time period. So because our, uh, you know, we, we, our uh, linear fit, uh, the slope of our linear fit effectively, in a way, is um, the ratio of people attending uh, the football match uh, versus the number of Instagram users. If the number of Instagram users is growing over time, the, the slope of our um, of our fitted line will change. So this is something that when working with data, you know, in this case from Instagram, but in general data from uh, you know, social media platform, for instance, um, you have to take into account the fact that the, effectively the sample of people that you're using is changing over time, in the sense that the popularity of the platform is changing over time. And that's why, you know, we hypothesized that we had that effect that the slope was uh, becoming smaller. And to address that, what we did was, well, if the over overall popularity of Instagram users is, uh, you know, the popularity of Instagram is growing, so overall the number of users is growing, this will be true regardless of whether I consider Instagram users that post something from the stadium or post something from, you know, the city center of Milan, for instance. So to, to address this, what we did, and that's what you can see in the second line, here, so plots C and D, is actually looking at the density of Instagram users. So we take the number of users posting from within the stadium, and we normalize that by the number of Instagram users across a much, the whole city of Milan, or a much larger area than the football stadium anyway. So what this does is effectively uh, removes the uh, fact that the number of users is growing because we are normalizing by the, the, the number of users. And as you can see, you know, by doing this, we actually find that even if we divide the data by football season, the two lines are you know, nearly overlapping, of course, you know, they won't overlap perfectly, but we have removed this, uh, this, uh, this effect. So I think, I, you know, other than on a technical level, let's say, but I think this is an important point when working with um, social media data and more generally, you know, with new forms of data, like, you know, like data coming from the internet and so on, you know, this is something that, you know, you have to account for if something that, you know, has to be, for instance, used in practice, okay, because Social media platforms, for instance, will change in popularity over time. Some will become more popular, some will become less popular. Um, you know, if you use um, data from some specific websites, those websites will become more or less popular. And therefore, this has something that will affect, um, you know, the, the, the data that you get affected for your analysis. And so it's something that has to be um, accounted for. Um, and in both cases, you know, in Milan and Rome, just kind of concluding this, we, uh, you know, we find that um, we have an uh, kind of average percentage error, which is in line with other techniques used to estimate crowds in, in different studies, which is uh, good. So it, typically our estimates are within 10 to 15% of the ground truth, which is in line with other uh, methods that, that people use, uh, which is uh, reassuring.
And then the last thing uh, that is important to keep in mind here is that, of course, in the case of football stadiums, um, the spatial area in which we focus our analysis is very well defined. The football stadium is well defined. You know, it's, called, uh, it's, it's a building effectively, so you can know exactly what the boundary is and you can really well extract information that is only you know, inside the stadium or say in the near proximity if you want to allow for you know, small uh, geolocalization errors coming from, uh, for instance, markets. However, in other kind of events, you know, the area where, which you, want to my, you might want to analyze to estimate the size of the crowd might not be as well defined. So what we did next was, well, what happens is, is if instead of using you know, exactly the area where the football stadium is located, we change the area for which we count, for instance, how many photos are posted on Instagram during the football match. So this is what you can see here. So on the, on the bottom uh, plus you have on the X axis, the radius of a circle that we use to count how many photos are posted on Instagram within that circle during a football match. And then on the Y axis, you have the uh, coefficient determination, so the squared correlation between the number of photos posted on Instagram and the uh, number of attendees at the match. And you can see that um, there's a slight difference between the two cities. And the reason you know, we think this could be is that um, you know, it depends what's in the proximity of the two stadiums, effectively. So in, in one case, in Milan, the football stadium, in near proximity, there's no uh, other big uh, kind of tourist attractions, if you want. And in Rome, instead, uh, it's, it's, there's other kind of hotspots where people gather to take, for instance, lots of photos and post them on Instagram. So depending on, on the exact location in which you want to estimate the size of the crowd, the definition of the spatial area that you use um, is going to be important. Okay? But in both cases, we see that, in both cases, we see that you know, as much as it is sensitive a bit to the area of analysis, it's not, um, you know, you can change it a little bit and still get a reasonable, um, kind of strong relationship, which is, um, which is good in terms of kind of real applications, if you want. So in this first example, uh, with, you know, with a couple of studies, I've shown you how we can use social media data, uh, so from Twitter and Instagram, and data from mobiles, mobile phones, so how, much, how many phone calls people make, how many text messages people send, or how much access to the internet there is coming from smartphones, to measure the size of a crowd in a small, um, let's say relatively small um, spatial area, that's for football stadium, and in a small time period. So again, you know, a couple of hours, let's say. Um, what I'm going to show you next is, well, can we use kind of similar ideas in a way to measure the number of people in, uh, again, in a relatively small spatial area, but over a much longer period of time, in particular, a period of time of a month. So what I'm going to talk about now is uh, a, a project that we did uh, to uh, look at how many people attend different museums uh, in the UK. So um, prior to COVID, at least, you know, thousands of people uh, visited museums in London every month, you know, so thousands of people would visit the National Gallery to have a look at the various paintings there, uh, you know, tens and hundreds of thousands of people would visit the, the Tate Modern, you know, the contemporary uh, art there. And again, you know, tens of, th of thousands of people would uh, visit the Natural History Museum, you know, to look at the dinosaurs and all the other cool things that they've got there. So in this project, we worked in collaboration with the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, uh, which I will call DCMS from now on, um, uh, to help them better understand the performance of the museums and galleries that they sponsor. So, um, a lot of, you know, the, all the museums that um, I've talked about and the ones that we've covered in our analysis are sponsored by DCMS, which means that they are free to access, uh, which of course is great, but this poses some challenges for DCMS to know uh, the performance of these museums, in particular in terms of how many people visit these museums on a monthly basis. So each of the museums collects data on how many people uh, visit them. However, because they are free, they don't have tickets, okay? So each museum has a slightly different uh, methodology of collecting this data, which is then kind of processed, aggregated, and then kind of quality assured, and then released by DCMS uh, to the public um, uh, with a delay of one month, or at least, uh, you know, it was when we, we did this study. What we looked at is, can we help um, DCMS provide faster uh, estimates of how many people are visiting their sponsored museums and galleries over time? And um, the way we did this is by looking at our uh, collective information seeking behavior. And what I mean by this, uh, you know, we'll be clear in a second, but effectively is how, you know, our kind of collective behavior in terms of uh, seeking information about a specific museum or gallery that we might be interested in uh, visiting. So as I said, 
so, yeah. So, as I said, um, DCMS releases the uh, visits of, to the sponsor museums and galleries through their website. So the time we did this study, it was released on a monthly basis. I think now it has slightly changed and then with COVID, uh, it probably changed uh, again. Uh, but at least at the time we did the study, this data was released on a monthly basis. But crucially, the data was released on a monthly basis with a delay of one month. So for instance, in this example, um, this data was referring to the monthly museum visitor figures for August in 2018, but this data was released on the 4th of October. So the August data was released at the beginning of October, effectively. So there was a delay of one month. So each month, DCMS would publish the number of visitors to their museums, but these would not be referring to the month just finished, but to the month before. And what we were, you know, what we tried to do in uh, this analysis was, well, can we uh, remove this delay of one month, provide estimates which are available straight away as soon as a month is finished. Now, there's different ways in which you could tackle this problem, and the most, um, let's say, kind of simple or intuitive way would be, well, you know, because DCMS uh, collects, releases this data monthly, you know, has been doing so for a number of years, you could simply look at the historical number of visitors and use uh, some very simple um, kind of time series techniques to actually predict what's going to have, you know, what uh, may have happened in a specific month based on historical data. So for instance, if we take a Tate Modern as an example, and we focus on a specific month, so for instance, August 2014, so we know that by looking at historical data, uh, kind of summer, so July and August typically are the months with the highest number of visitors. Okay, so can we use this very simple approach by saying, well, August 2014, for instance, could be similar to August 2013, August 2015, could be similar to what happened in August 2014. So we just use simply the same month from the previous year. And you know, in some cases, this might work well, but in other cases, um, this wouldn't have worked uh, very well. Okay, of course, this is a very rough way of estimating it, but you know, but um, it does show that you know the historical visits data and simple analysis of historical visits data alone doesn't necessarily uh, work very well. And in fact, if you do this for Tate Modern generating estimates based on the previous year. Uh, same month the previous year, you, you get an average percentage of 40, 41%. Of course, as I said, this is a very rough way of doing it. You can use slightly more sophisticated uh, time series analysis techniques that take into account not just the same month the previous year, but also general, other general trends. So if you look, for instance, the Riva model, which takes into account, as I said, various properties of the time series, you can reduce your, uh, your percentage error quite significantly to 23%. However, what we um, you know, what we wanted to do was well, uh, well, try and verify whether we can improve this by, as I said, looking at our information seeking behavior. And what I mean by that is using what we search for online. So if you are, you know, like, like me, if I, you know, if I have to go to a museum, say, take modern, um, I might want to look up on Google when it is open, when it is closed. You know, I might want to look up uh, how to get there. So what, you know, bus stop or tube stop I have to get off to get there. Um, if there is any special exhibition on. Or, or, you know, generally uh, find information through Google on specific museum or gallery they want to visit. So what we did was, well, can we use the volume information so that, uh, that uh, people look for on the internet via Google to actually have an, a, an idea of the interest in a specific museum or gallery for a given month and use that to generate estimates. So we, had, um, we used for these uh, data from Google Trends, which is openly available data, um, which tells, uh, you know, which uh, tells us the amount of search volume to, for a specific uh, topics, in this case, Tate Modern, London, non, uh, Tate Modern in London, um, on a monthly basis. Okay. And what we uh, use this for is to enhance our time series model that is not then going to be based only on um, historical data alone, but it's also going to be based on the volume of uh, how much people are searching for, in this case, Tate Modern on Google. And if we uh, include this information in our time series model, we actually can uh, reduce our error to about 14, 15.5%, depending on, uh, on you know, the, the specific period of the nice data for. And we did this, uh, as you state model as an example, but we did this over the whole range of model, um, sorry, museums and galleries sponsored by DCMS. Uh, for instance, here again, you take model, but also science museum, natural history museums, and all of the other uh, sites that uh, are sponsored by DCMS. And for some museums, it works better than some others, but across all museums, we find that using data from Google Trends, so enhancing our time series model using data from Google Trends, improves the estimates um, in a statistically significant way um, across all of museums. 
And what is important uh, with this is also that data from Google Trends is available, let's say, kind of in, in, uh, in real time in the sense that if you want to generate the estimates of how many people visited, say, Tate Modern in uh, August 2018, which is the example that we started from, um, this could be done as soon as August 2018 is finished because data for, you know, search volume data for August 2018 is released by Google Trends on the first day of September um, 2018. So we would be able to generate these estimates with a, uh, with a uh, you know, ahead or a month ahead of the date that uh, DCMS releases uh, these numbers, okay, which, is, uh, which is great, which is what we kind of set out to do. Um, and again, you know, another um, important point that I want to make is that, uh, so you know, we've used uh, specific search terms on Google Trends. For instance, on, you know, when looking at the number of pieces to take more than, we used how many people or, or um, the search volume that Google Trends releases, so it's an index, it's not actually the number of people, you know, the search volume of uh, Tate model on Google Trends uh, for the specific month under consideration. However, you know, what we wanted to, you know, further validate our analysis and test the robust analysis because, you know, you might think that actually the volume of searches for a specific museum or gallery, say Tate Modern, um, is not necessarily indicating of how many people are interested in that in the specific museum or gallery, but it might be for instance, an indicator of how many people are interested in visiting London in a specific month. Okay, so actually maybe what we're using, you know, the, the data that we use from Google Trends is not necessarily only indicating the interest in a specific museum, but it's indicating the interest in visiting an area such as London. So what we did to validate our analysis was, well, can we repeat exactly the same analysis, but instead of enhancing our models with Google Trends data uh, related to a specific museum, say Tate Modern, we use Google Trends data related to a topic which is potentially slightly related to a tape model, but not directly. So this is what, um, oops, sorry, let's keep the slide. Um, this is what I'm showing you here. So instead of using the actual museum uh, topic, so uh, that's what you can see in panel A, A here. So if, uh, in panel A, you can see the difference of a model, an error of the model which uses the historical data alone. So that's the pale red line and the darker red line is a model which has uh, Google Trends data in it. And you can see that there is a difference in the model Google Trends data is more rare. If instead of using the data for the corresponding museum, we use data from Google Trends, for instance, on how many people are searching for Buckingham Palace or London or Hyde Park or Holiday or you know, all the topics that you can see here, and we, we try and enhance our time series model using data for, for that specific topic, we find that actually those, uh, you know, that Google Trends data doesn't add any significant valuable information. And the estimates generated in that way are effectively the same as the estimates generated using historical data alone. So this indicates that, you know, the, the, the search volume of the specific museum or topic is actually containing information of how many people not how many people, but the interest to, uh, of people going to that specific museum or gallery, and not more broadly the interest, for instance, of people visiting you know, other attractions in London, such as uh, Buckingham Palace or Hyde Park or generally London. And so this was a good validation of our, um, of our analysis um, that really showcased the fact that you know, using specific uh, you know, topics of related to a specific museum is actually uh, providing a valuable information of how many people are visiting uh, that museum or gallery. And then finally, to conclude, um, these, um, so this project was in collaboration with DCMS. So we uh, were uh, reporting our estimates and our analysis to DCMS. And I think one thing which is also important, we're working with you know, policymakers uh, and uh, you know, carrying out the science analysis to policymakers is that you know, not everyone, um, you know, the, uh, not all the policymakers we might be working with uh, might uh, either be interested or have the technical skills in understanding you know, repeating or producing the analysis uh, themselves, but they might still want to have access to, um, you know, to the results of the analysis or to visualizations of the analysis that might be helpful for, for them to, um, you know, to, to, to inform their um, you know, the decisions or just their general, um, let's say, thoughts. So what we did was developing a dashboard, which, uh, you know, people with DCMS uh, had access to, that would basically um, give them access to the analysis that we had, but in a kind of user-friendly way, so you, they could pick a selection of the museums that we had in our analysis. They could simply click a button that would uh, carry out the analysis and it would um, you know, show the results of the analysis in a kind of interactive way. So they could interact with the plot, have a look at the different, um, the different data, the location of the museum, 
have the report of the analysis that uh, kind of uh, highlighted the results, not just for a museum, for other museum, but also allowed more, uh, kind of more uh, kind of deeper uh, kind of investigation of the of the data. Uh, you know, in case people were really interested in so having a you know, his, the option of having a historical analysis and kind of playing a bit with the parameters uh, as well, uh, in case uh, in case they were interested. And so this, um, as you know, in, in this in this second example, then I've shown how we can use data again from um, you know, our interactions with um, kind of the the digital world, if you want. So the, in this case, uh, our interactions with the internet, in particular, our seeking information seeking behavior um, by looking for information on Google to measure effectively again the size of the crowd going to a museum, but over a, a period of one month. So in both examples, we've seen how we can use you know new forms of data. From social media data, mobile phone data, data from the internet, to measure you know groups of people, uh, either football matches, so in crowds gathering in a small period of time, or in crowds, in a sense, gathering or attending uh, visiting museums and galleries over a period of one month. So, moving on to kind of more recent work that I've been doing, based on this, we can you know we can then be reasonably um, confident that we can use this data to measure you know people, the presence of people across different parts of our cities. Okay, so it can be you know, I've shown you football stadiums or museums, but in general, you know, we can we can think, okay, we can use data from these sources to measure, you know, where people spend time in the city. Um, so more recent work that I've been doing focuses on uh, looking at, you know, what features of our urban environments are actually encouraging people to, uh, to spend time, social time in, in different parts of the city. So kind of going back to, you know, um, Two decades, um, you know, there's lots of theories about uh, what makes urban uh, environments vibrant. So by that I mean, you know, urban environments which are kind of vibrant in the sense of um, you know, this kind of buzzing activity of people there, which is not necessarily only driven by the fact that lots of people live there, but also because people decide to spend time there. So they travel there to spend social time. And this theory is going back to Jane Jacobs, for instance, they look at various aspects of urban environments and how they affect urban life and how they may affect or be related to urban vibrancy, so to making cities or specific environments in cities vibrant. And of course, some of these are rather intuitive in a way, if you want. So things like, you know, like places like restaurants or shops uh, might encourage people to spend a lot of time there because they um, uh, they go there to go, you know, socialize in the restaurant, in the bar, and so on. Uh, and so this is uh, uh, obviously going to play a role, but also um, this theory is about how the actual structure of the road and the cities um, may be related. So for instance, um, an urban environment with lots of roads that intersect one another can favor kind of you know people walking around um, and kind of crossing roads and walking around different parts of the, the of the neighborhood uh, in a more easy way. So if you have lots, if you have only you know one long straight road that doesn't have any crossings or doesn't cross any other road, it's hard to okay, kind of accidentally bumping to people, for instance. So the structure of the road network has also been uh, kind of studied for how, you know, how it might be related to, to, to urban environments and how, how vibrant they are. And of course, more recent work as well uh, has been done relating uh, the, the presence of green spaces uh, in cities and how, of course, they are linked uh, both to our you know, kind of mental and physical health and how they might be linked to uh, you know, kind of better quality of life, for instance. And in general, you know, this, the idea of the presence of green spaces uh, could be related to you know, people spending, uh, spending time there. So a lot of these features uh, of our cities and the presence of different types of urban environments has been studied. Um, but one thing which I think is particularly interesting is um, um, so now we have access to these data, so for instance, data from mobile phones and social media, which we can use to kind of estimate where people spend time in different parts of the city. So this is being done as a proxy of you know, where people are, um, because you could use things like the census, but the census tells you where people live, not necessarily where they spend time. But using data from mobile phones is actually uh, providing you a, a different proxy for, for where people spend time. But what I um, think is, uh, is interesting and, and needs further study is, well, are these features that uh, you know uh, enhance people spending time in different parts of the city kind of universal across different uh, type uh, you know demographic groups? So different, uh, for instance, people people of different ages. So are people uh, of uh, from younger age groups uh, kind of spending uh, uh, time and um, socializing and, and kind of gathering in parts of the of the city which have similar structure to part to where uh, people of older age groups gather as well. So these, uh, in this project, we looked exactly 
exactly these problems. So can be, you know, can we understand what features of urban environments um, are uh, encouraging people of different age groups to, 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 uh, to gather effectively? So again, we had access to a large mobile phone data, again from Telecom Italia for cities in Italy. But what was interesting about this mobile phone data set was that uh, it was uh, you know, telling us the presence of uh, mobile phone users from one mobile phone company. Of course, you know, this has some limitations because uh, it's only one mobile phone company. But what was interesting is that we had uh, information on uh, the age group of these people. So we knew uh, in this specific uh, cell, so the data was the area under analysis divided into small cells. In these specific cells, at this specific uh, time interval, there were and then a number of people in the age group over 60 or in the age group 50 to 60 or 40 to 50. So, and we can use this as a proxy of how many people are of different age groups are spending time in different parts of the city. And we can relate this to various aspects of our cities. So what we looked at are some uh, features that are uh, been studied uh, before in the kind of urban uh, science literature. So these are features that we've derived from the census, for instance, so the Italian census. And these are things like um, the number of buildings that are present in an area, uh, there's theories that a variety of um, buildings of you know, older buildings and newer buildings, a high variety of this and diversity of these types of building might be um, in, you know, encouraging um, urban vibrancy because buildings of different ages encourage different types of businesses, different types of restaurants, different types of cafes, and, and might be uh, therefore encouraging to, to a more a vibrant environment. And of course, the number of buildings in, in modern cities not necessarily the only way in which you can have a dense urban environment, you can have uh, kind of vertical density as well. So, you know, the buildings that are uh, have got many floors, so we also look at the vertical density uh, as extracted from the Italian census. But also now, on top of all the data that I've already talked about, we also have very good information on what is present in our cities, in particular from uh, kind of openly available data sources such as OpenStreetMap, which is a large crowdsourcing uh, tool where people simply, uh, you know, map. Uh, you know, every environment. So, this, you know, it's got very, well, you know, why is this, you know, you can't expect it to be fully complete. It has got very co a large coverage, very good coverage of lots of, for instance, European uh, countries. So if you look in particular at cities, uh, OpenStreetMap will have very good uh, representation of the road network, what types of buildings are, are, are where, uh, what, you know, what specific um, uh, you know, points of interest are in, in a specific area and so on and so forth. And this data is all openly available. And again, this data that was not easily available until, you know, until, until recently. So it kind of uh, adds to the data that we now have from mobile phones. And we use this data to measure, to extract some, some of the features that uh, have been used in the, in the urban science literature in the past. So things like the, the road network, we can calculate how many roads there are in a specific area, how many intersections there are. Uh, OpenStreetMap has, has lots of types of points of interest. You know, these can be things like a museum, but also like a cafe or a monument, and, and, and so on and so forth. And also, we can calculate um, how in the variety of play points of interest that there are in the specific area. Because again, in you know, the kind of urban studies literature, the variety of points of interest is uh, you know, thought to be a kind of um, encouraging to, uh, to people to, to, to gather there. And then finally, we also look at a concept which is known as third places. So again, this is something that's taken from the urban studies literature, which is the idea that you know, in, in life we have, in a way, if you want, three places. So the first place is where we live, our second place is where we work, but the third places are where we gather to kind of spend social time, you know, to, to uh, patients that foster social interactions um, you know, by us traveling to those places, going to those places and spending time you know, you know, with, with people that we uh, spend time to socialize with. So we, we categorized um, features extracted from OpenStreetMap to extract what uh, you know, the uh, potential third places are. And we use these as features in our study. And as I said, we have data on the different uh, presence of different uh, age groups in term, as measured from mobile phone users. And these are from uh, you know, less than 18 years old, people from 18 to 30, 31 to 40, 41 to 50, 51 to 60, and over 60. So uh, if we perform a simple kind of correlation analysis between the presence of the various features and the presence of people from different age groups, uh, we find um, you know, a good relationship. So we find you know, one specific feature uh, has a negative relationship, but um, um, some of them have quite, have quite good relationships with the vertical density and the points of interest and third places seem to be positively related to the uh, presence of people of different age groups. Um, what is interesting here is the fact that, you know, regardless of the age group, so, you know, the age groups doesn't seem to 
play a significant role. Okay, so age groups, you know, this could be, I guess this could be because of two reasons. One could be a, uh, an issue of either of the analysis or of the quality of the data, okay? Or it could be uh, that uh, actually the urban features that we considered are um, kind of enhancing urban vibrancy in, uh, you know, kind of universal in a way across different age groups. This, of course, could be specific to the fact that we studied, you know, for instance, Italian cities in cities in different countries worldwide. This might be different, but this is something that is quite interested. And in fact, if we replicate, you know, if we extend our analysis beyond the simple correlation analysis, so we did it using a uh, variety of spatial models to account for the fact that we have spatial um, dependencies to data, we again find uh, some interesting results that don't depend uh, significantly on the age groups. And what our spatial analysis actually highlights is that uh, a strong uh, component of what enhances urban vibrancy, so what enhances people spending time in different parts of the city, is actually the concept of third place, as I said. And this is perhaps not that surprising in a way, because these are places that are, you know, um, this is the notion of third places is defined as the you know, places that people spend social time in. And the different categories in which you can spend social time. So this could be some things like commercial venues, but also uh, you can um, spend uh, social time in places where there's organized activities. Um, but you know what is uh, apparent from here is that uh, you know these kind of places are really um, what fosters uh, you know the the, 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 the concept of urban vibrancy, so the presence of different people in, in, a, in an urban environment which again is something which is quite interesting and it's interesting that again we don't find any significant differences across different age groups. Again, you know, there could be different explanations for this, uh, you know, data limitations or simply the fact that uh, in, uh, you know, in, uh, in urban environments, at least, you know, in these cities that we considered, the features that are present don't uh, affect differently people different, of different age groups. Um, Moving on to, a, to another study where, which I've uh, been working on uh, kind of more recently um, in collaboration with some people for, within my department is a study where we looked at using mobile phone data to actually understand uh, mobility patterns or, you know, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So, as I, you know, as hopefully it's clear um, from the examples I've shown you so far is that, you know, we can use this data to monitor where people are and therefore we can use this data to monitor how much people move around. So in this study, we had access to data, uh, to a large sample of, uh, of data of um, uh, related to the UK for the time period uh, of the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in the UK. So what you can see here is how much the mobility has changed across the whole of the UK from, I think, February until the end of March 2020. So the more blue it is, the more, the larger the reduction in mobility there is. So in the beginning of February, there wasn't such a big reduction of mobility, of course, but then as the restrictions came into place, we saw a large reduction in mobility, which of course is what you would expect. And, um, you know, just to show you a kind of different interactive visualization here, you can see how the mobility has changed. And this is a slightly longer time period across the different uh, nations of, of the UK. So different nations have slightly different rules and therefore slightly different uh, changes in mobility, but, you know, the overall pattern is similar. What, so this is just kind of, I guess, general um, you know, visualizations I'm showing you. But what we're really interested in here is, can we actually use this to understand how, um, how different uh, you know, socioeconomic groups reacted, responded differently to the restrictions in mobility? So this has got several, uh, you know, it's interesting for several reasons. The first one, you know, and the more uh, obvious one is, you know, why do we expect there to be a difference? Well, for some people, um, uh, you know, depending on their socioeconomic backgrounds, for instance, depending on their uh, on, on what job they have, it may be more or less easy to work from home. Okay, so some people may have to uh, still travel to to go to work, and some for some other people it may be uh, much easier to work from home. So this is one one reason, and this is important because, you know, the, I guess you know, if people move around more, they're more likely to, to interact, you know. And, and be close to other people, and this might be affecting uh, the, the way people get infected, for instance, uh, depending on the, on the socioeconomic group. So we're really looking at how different socioeconomic groups uh, were affected differently by the restriction measures, even though in principle, you know, measures are not, were not designed to be affecting, you know, to, were designed to be kind of affecting the whole population, but in practice, you know, these might have affected, has affected the, the different people in different ways. And the other thing that is, is quite interesting to look at is because 
you know, for for and well now for quite a long period of time, uh, you know, our traditional patterns have been quite disrupted. So we have been, you know, a lot of people have been working from home. Um, I've hardly ever been to the to my office uh, at the university, for instance. Um, so this part, this change in patterns will have affect our uh, kind of collective behavior uh, in interesting ways. So for instance, before COVID, you know, everyone would just kind of get up at roughly the same time, go commute at roughly the same time. So we had a highly synchronized behavior. Is this synchronicity still present in the, you know, in the last, has this synchronicity still been present in the last year? And so as we, have we kept somehow similar patterns, even though they were not enforced in a way by uh, kind of committing hours, for instance, uh, anymore or not. So this is another thing which I think is quite interesting that we are, uh, we're currently looking at. And hopefully we'll have some, uh, some results soon. And then, oops, uh, finally, a, a last, uh, last, uh, project, the recent project I've been uh, working on together with, uh, with a student uh, here in the department uh, of computer science Exeter is on looking at uh, measuring uh, deprivation uh, in London. So, the, you know, um, as you know, probably um, the uh, UK government released uh, well, uh, different countries in the UK release these data slightly differently, but at least in England, there is uh, the Ministry of Housing, uh, the local housing, I think, that releases the English. Um, and this is a multiple deprivation, which is a measure of the deprivation across the whole of England uh, that ranks how different areas are, you know, how deprived different areas are across England. And this is data that is recently released publicly every roughly every five years, and um, and is used to inform, you know, policy making and planning uh, local authorities levels and uh, local government levels uh, and so on. So it's data which is very important tells us a lot about uh, you know, about what's going on in, in, in different parts of the country. However, you know, it's released every five years for a variety of reasons, but one of which being that, you know, as often is the case for this kind of data, it's actually quite, you know, it's a time consuming process to gather this data. The index, of, the index of multiple deprivation is derived from a variety of data sources, such as um, I think like shops data and tax data and, and, sales in, in, and all sorts of, uh, you know, measures related to health, uh, measures related to crime. So there's a lot of data that is fed into the, in what is released as the indices of multiple deprivation. And this takes time uh, to, to gather, to collect, and then to aggregate and kind of uh, release. And that's why this data is, um, is released um, uh, not, not, you know, not every month, for instance, um, at least um, not to the same level uh, everywhere. Um, however, you know, this data, as I said, is hugely important for understanding what, you know, how different parts of a city, for instance, you know, if you think about London, it's a huge city, how different parts of a city are changing over time, and some parts of a city change relatively rapidly. Um, so, for instance, you know, cities, parts of a city which are not very deprived could be become deprived relatively quickly, or vice versa, parts which are deprived could, could uh, become uh, less deprived uh, over time. So, having access of to at least fast, faster measurements of the instances of deprivation could be very important and interesting um, for uh, policymakers and authorities. Um, even you know, though this doesn't necessarily mean this doesn't mean that uh, the traditional way of measuring deprivation is to, going to be replaced. Having a, a more granular and rapid uh, estimate of deprivation over time could be still could still be of interest uh, in between the the, the official release of uh, this multiple deprivation. So what we worked on uh, in this uh, project was. Uh, specifically to the city of London, we had access to um, what people were buying from a large uh, you know, supermarket, so namely Tesco, uh, for different uh, LSOAs in London. So this information contains, it's all aggregated, so there's no in, uh, kind of personalized uh, in personal data, individual data, it's all aggregated, so LSOA level, there's information in the data such as you know, the average fiber content or the average protein content, both in the area, um, for a specific time period. Uh, so this was uh, a, a year uh, of, of data, so that's 2015. And so there's uh, several um, links that could be done between you know, what people buy uh, and, what, you know, and how the private area is. Of course, this, you know, this, this is quite a few you know, limitations to bear in mind this, but um, um, we, we can talk about this later. But the kind of general idea is that what people uh, buy and the uh, not, not necessarily how much, they, well, not only how much they buy in the supermarket, uh, but also what they buy. So the content, uh, you know, kind of the, the nutritional content of different products that they buy might be related to the index of multiple creation. This is for a variety of reasons. One being that part of the index of multiple creation data comes from health-related data. And there's a clear link between the nutritional value of what we buy, you know, and what we eat every day to the health 
of the people uh, living in an area. So there's a link there. And so what we, uh, we tried to do in this project was, where well, can we use the aggregated volume of what people buy in an area to actually measure the deprivation of the area? Because if this was possible, then you know, these data, whilst it's not uh, it, it typically kind of publicly available, but if this was available, you know, it could be used by local authorities, for instance, to have access to more, uh, you know, kind of rapid estimates of deprivation over time, which would then complement the traditional ways of measuring deprivation. So, in kind of this initial analysis, what we did is we looked at all the various kind of nutritional components and, uh, and, and various components of the, of the, uh, say, grocery uh, shopping data that, that we had, and uh, initially correlated to the index of multiple deprivation at the, at the LSOA level. And we find that um, some uh, components which are strongly positively, uh, uh, relatively strongly, you know, for, for, the, for the kind of measure that we have, it's a rough aggregated measure at the LSOA level, the, 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 we have find either positive or negative correlation depending on different, um, different uh, components with the index of multiple deprivation of different LSOAs. Okay, which is uh, which is quite interesting. Okay, you know, I've selected here a few just to kind of show uh, which ones have kind of got a larger and smaller correlation with index multiplication. But as you can see, there's about I think 180 different components in our data set. And what we do then is we train a machine learning algorithm, namely uh, a random forest, um, to see if we can use this data to actually predict or infer the deprivation of specific uh, LSOA. And we rank uh, different features by importance. Okay, so you, as you can see that. Of course, the features which are more correlated tend to uh, end up having being more important in our machine learning algorithm as you'd expect. And um, so this provides an initial indication that there is a link between uh, you know, what people buy and the deprivation of different areas. Of course, as I said, there's quite a few limitations in, 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 the, the, in the quality of the data in a, in a way, or it's your assumptions uh, at least. Um, but you know, we find a reasonable, uh, a reasonable uh, relationship there. And what is interesting is that, well, you know, we have access to these large uh, number of features, but actually, you know, are they all necessary? As we find, you know, as we see here, a lot of them have got a correlation which is not as, uh, as large as some others. So can we actually identify, you know, what happens if we only had access to a much smaller subset of features? And the reason why this is interesting is that if we can find a way of estimating the deprivation using only a very small set of features, it might be easier to have access to a much smaller set of features than asking, well, actually, I want access to, you know, the, you know, the kind of the full, uh, say, 180 uh, different variables that we have here. Can we just use, for instance, 10 of those or 15 of those? So this is what you can see here on the left. So what we find, what you can see on the, on the x-axis on the left is the number of features dropped. So we start from 180 features and we uh, progressively remove one of them at a time in decreasing, increasing order of importance. And what you have on the y-axis is the accuracy of our model. So you see that up to all the way you have, until you have removed up to 160, the, the least 160 important features, actually the score of our model doesn't really change at all. It's only when you start removing the most important features that, your, uh, that our model starts to observe a significant decrease in score, which is uh, indicating basically that you only actually need a small subset of the features to actually have a reasonable uh, score of our machine learning model. And then finally, um, you know, we, uh, in deprivation, the index of multiple deprivations are used to rank different areas, so in which areas are more or less deprived. Um, and often, you know, people are interested in the more deprived areas or the least deprived areas. So we divide areas in deciles. So we take the top 20% and the lower 20% of which uh, of the different uh, LSOAs in London. So the top 20% deprived and top 20% least deprived and we try and predict them with our machine learning method. So this is what you can see on the right. So as you can see, our method roughly gets it right. It doesn't get it perfectly right, uh, but it roughly gets the fact that, um, you know, areas which are more deprived are predicted to be on the more deprived end of the scale, and areas which are least deprived are predicted to be on the least deprived end of the scale. But of course, it has, uh, you know, it has, uh, it, you know, by no means is, uh, is predicting this perfectly, but it does show that it's kind of going in the right direction, which is, uh, which is interesting because as I said, the data is quite uh, roughly aggregated. Okay, so it is data uh, aggregated at LSOA level. People don't necessarily buy from the supermarket in their LSOA. So there's lots of limitations in the data set, but even so, we can get some indication of, of which are the most least deprived areas, which I think uh, is particularly interesting. 
Um, so this is uh, everything in terms of the kind of research projects that I wanted to talk about. I'm just going to end on a shameless uh, advertising slide in the sense that I am leading the organization of a summer school in Exeter uh, University. Um, so this is going to take place the last week of July. It's going to be online only. And the summer school is going to focus specifically on urban analytics. Um, it's aimed at, in principle, it's aimed at kind of of end, uh, you know, kind of final year undergraduate students in computer science, but people that might not come from a computer science background, even though they're you know, further on in their studies than undergraduates, they might still be interested in knowing, in learning some of the skills they are taught in this school. So the school will teach some basic you know, machine learning techniques and data analysis techniques that are useful to study uh, urban environments. So cities using the kind of data and not only, but using, for instance, the kind of data they've talked about this. Um, you know, the last hour. So is this something that you are interested in or think some of your students might be interested in, uh, you know, please, uh, you know, do get in touch with me if you, if you want to find out more. And with that, I will end here. Thank you very much for listening.